So I want to, I have a sort of a grab bag of topics in this last uh, uh, lecture. So I've talked about infinity topoi, characterization in terms of descent, local classes and universal families, and truncation and connectivity. So I've noticed that the, I can look at the full subcategory of intruncated infinity groupoids. And so these are what are called in groupoids, or sorry, in, yes, these are called in groupoids. Um, S less than or equal to zero is equivalent to the one category of sets. Um, S less than or equal to minus one is equivalent to the one category, actually poset of propositions. That poset. S less than or equal to N is an example of an N plus one category, or as I said, it's really N plus one comma one category, but I'll use Leary's terminology, it's easier. Um, so in, in this setting, an, A is an N plus one category if all of its mapping spaces are in groupoids. That's the definition. So just as we can look at pre-sheaves of infinity groupoids, we can look at pre-sheaves of n groupoids. I'll say n minus one groupoids. So C will be an, some infinity category, probably small. And I can look at functors on C op with values in n minus one infinity groupoids. This is actually the same or equivalent to the full subcategory of n minus one truncated objects in the pre-sheaf category, pre-sheaves of pre-sheaves valued in infinity group points. That's because truncation of pre-sheaves is computed pointwise. So I'll write this as pre-sheaves C less than or equal to n minus one. Um, one more fact about this. Um, if you have an infinity category C, then there's a, a best approximation to an N category. So I'll call that thing the map from C to HNC. So HNC is an N category. And this map is initial among functors to N categories. So it turns out this functor category is equivalent to a functor, always equivalent to a functor category on some N category. So when I talk about pre-sheaves, a, a category of pre-sheaves of n minus one groupoids, I might as well assume that the domain is an n category. Well, lots of general, at least I can do that. Okay. So we can define analogously to infinity topos, the notion of an n topos. So it's the same definition, um, except that I replace the role of uh, 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 infinity groupoids pre-sheaves of infinity groupoids with pre-sheaves of n minus one groupoids. So it's infinity category E, such there exists a small infinity category. I'll see an accessible, fully faithful embedding of E into pre-sheaves of n minus one groupoids, which has a left adjoint, which is left exact. And as I said before, I can actually, without loss of generality, assume that C is itself an n category if I wish. So for example, a one topos is exactly, well, the same in the sense that it's the infinity categorical, um, in an infinity categorical language, it's the same as a Grotendieck topos. Every one topos in this sense is equivalent to a Grotendieck topos in the classical sense, because when n equals one, that's pre-sheaves of c less than equal to zero, so that's the zero truncated, that's pre-sheaves, of zero truncated infinity group or it's so really pre-sheaves of sets. A zero topos is exactly the same as a locale, or really a frame or a complete hating algebra, various synonyms. Okay. Um, if you start with an infinity topos and you look at the n minus one truncated objects, 
that is an n topos. Um, that's pretty easy to assume. Remember, let's suppose that our infinity topos, that's easy to prove. I suppose our infinity topos um, is, you know, let's pick a left exact localization. So a presentation is a left exact localization of some pre-sheaf category. So I have this full subcategory of n minus one truncated objects in E, but I have a similar thing in pre-sheaves. And remember that um, truncation is characterized by a condition on the iterated diagonal. Um, so it's a limit condition, a condition in terms of finite limits. And both L and I preserve this condition. Therefore, they preserve truncated objects. Therefore, they restrict two functors on these subcategories, which are necessarily have the appropriate properties, as you can prove. Certainly, I is uh, fully faithful. You can show it's accessible. And L is still left exact. So for instance, for any infinity topos, the zero truncated objects are a Grotendieck topos. And the minus one truncated objects, which is the same thing as sub objects of the terminal object is a locale, opposite of a locale. Okay. Furthermore, there's a fact, uh, I won't try to prove it now, but any n topos is an n minus one truncation of some infinity topos. Um, I'll warn you here. So when you for have an infinity topos E, you will call E less than equal to zero the underlying one topos. But that is not a complete invariant. You can certainly have different infinity topoi which have the same underlying one topos. Um, easy example comes from infinity groupoids. Take your favorite infinity groupoid, then you can form the slice over that infinity groupoid, and that is an infinity topos. Now I can take the zero truncation. That is equivalent to the functor category from the fundamental groupoid of your space into sets. That's the fundamental groupoid. So the zero truncation of this infinity topos only depends on the fundamental groupoid of X. However, the infinity topos itself actually depends on X itself. Fundamental groupoid is certainly not a complete homotopy invariant of spaces. Um, therefore, for any infinity topos, we get this chain of full subcategories uh, of uh, sub of objects with various truncation levels. And we have left adjoints going back, which are called truncation functors. So TR1, TR0. The truncation functors are not left exact. They do preserve finite products, but they're not left exact. Um, so at this point, I'm going to return to this question that I introduced in the first lecture which is where the or second lecture, I guess, where are the Grotendieck topologies in this game? So I have to think generally about left exact localizations. So let me first establish some terminology. So by a localization, and I think reflection is a better term here, but it's sort of standard to call it localization. Um, so it's a picture like this. You have a fully faithful embedding with a left adjoint. Um, I can identify, because it's fully faithful, I can identify D with its essential image. And so in practice, I will just do that. I will assume that D is a subcategory, a full subcategory. Um, when you have a localization, you have something that I'll call the kernel. This may have some standard name, but I couldn't figure out what it was. So I'll just call it the kernel. Um, that's the class of morphisms in E that are inverted by the left adjoint. So it's the class if it only is. So it's the class of morphisms that L takes to an isomorphism. Any kernel has the property of being strongly saturated, assuming E has co-limits. Um, isomorphisms, of course, are in the kernel tautologically. 
Um, it has the two out of three property. So if I have two morphisms in a composition and any two in T implies sort of all of them are in T. And lastly, this class, this kernel is stable under colimits computed in the arrow category. So if I compute a colimit in the arrow category, it's actually also in T. So every localization determines a strongly saturated class. You send the localization to its kernel. Um, it's act, that's an injective correspondence in the sense that from the kernel, you can recover the uh, localization. The full subcategory is the class of what are called local objects. So it's the class of objects such that the map induced by mapping by any T going to X as an isomorphism for every morphism in the class T. If E is a presentable infinity category, then you can classify the accessible localizations using the theory of uh, presentable infinity categories. These correspond exactly to the strongly saturated um, classes that are generated by a set. So T equals S bar for some set of morphisms. So it's a size restriction. So this S bar is the strong saturation. of S. It's the smallest class of morphisms containing S and closed under those properties. Two out of three isomorphisms, two out of three colimits. So this is a correspondence. For any set, you can build a localization whose kernel is the strong saturation of that set. Um, if I want to think about left exact localizations, so those are going to, oh, this should probably be accessible. And these are strongly saturated classes that are the saturation of a set. But the left exact property corresponds to the classes where the kernel is, in addition, closed under base change. It's closed under you know, taking pullbacks along any map. But that's proved by an elementary argument, which actually works just as well in the one categorical setting. In general, uh, right. Okay, so the key question that one would like to answer and have a good answer for, if you have an infinity topos, how do you classify the left exact localizations? Um, there's some things to say about this. I will not say everything there is to say. Um, I, I think there's going to be a talk in the conference next week about this exact topic, but I'll tell you a little bit. So let's suppose I have an infinity topos. Let's suppose I have a left exact localization and I'll call it kernel T. So that T gives you a local class. I think of the kernel as a, I'm thinking of it as a full subcategory of the arrow category. So I'll take the intersection with the Cartesian arrow category. That intersection is a local class. Um, that's uh, actually very straightforward to prove using the left exactness of the localization. It's certainly closed under base change and it's closed under co-limits uh, in the Cartesian category because in fact it's closed under co-limits in the arrow category. As a consequence we have the following. If I have a pullback square where I'm pulling back along a cover, then if F is in the kernel, then so is G. Okay, so that's a property of kernels because they are local classes. Now, still assuming I have an infinity topos and a left exact localization with kernel T, I have the following interesting condition uh, on elements in the kernel. If I take a morphism F and I make its cover mono factorization, so I is a monomorphism, P is a cover, Then the morphism is in the kernel. The morphism F is in the kernel. 
if and only if i is in the kernel and the diagonal of f is in the, is in the kernel. So this is a more or less elementary argument using left exactness. Um, I'll give some, I'll give it sort of very briefly. So in one direction, suppose f is in the kernel. Well, that means that L of f is an isomorphism. L is the chiefification, the left adjoint. L of a monomorphism is automatically a monomorphism because it's a left exact localization. The hypothesis is that L of f is an isomorphism. And now all of a sudden, when I apply L, I've got a monomorphism, which has a section, the inverse of L of f composed with, the, with L of p. Well, it is true, even in infinity categories, that monomorphisms with sections are isomorphisms. So this tells you that I is in t, because L of i is an isomorphism. And then the other property is straightforward because L is left exact, the diagonal of L is L, sorry, L of the diagonal is the diagonal of L. So you can use that to show that delta F is in T. Okay. In the other direction, I want to show that if these two things are true, then F is in the kernel. So first of all, if I form, if I think about the diagonal of F, which is a map from A to A times over B A, um, I can factor that through the diagonal of P, where P is part of this mono cover factorization. The second map in that factorization is actually a pullback of I in some sense. It is itself a monomorphism. And because it's formed by pullbacks from I, and the localization is left exact, and since if I assume that I is in T, then so is J. And since I'm gonna assume here that the diagonal of F is in T, I actually have the diagonal of P is in T. So I wanna to get to showing that F is in T. Well, I also have this diagram on the bottom. Here's the diagonal of P. Um, it maps to this pullback, which is the square on the right. Well, if the diagonal of P is in T, since it's factors with Q, it factors the identity, two out of three, implies that q is in t. Oh, but now I also have this p here, which is a cover. And I just proved this property that if this class, this property of being in t is local. So because p is in, is a cover and q is in t, I get that p is in t. And since I've already assumed that i is in t, that's what part of my hypothesis, the composite is in t. Just thought I'd go through that argument. Uh, I think I didn't use, don't think I really used anything here that wouldn't work in, say, a one topos. As a consequence, if I have one of these left exact localizations of an infinity topos with kernel T, um, for any N, any finite N, the, well, I haven't defined that for infinity, but the intersection of T with in, with the class of N truncated maps is determined entirely by the intersection with the monomorphisms. Or to make it more explicit, um, if I have an N truncated map, which means that it's N plus two iterated diagonal is an isomorphism, um, it's in the kernel if and only if the sequence of maps I zero, I one up to N, I N minus one is in T, where those are constructed inductively. Um, I guess like this. So these are the coming from, let's just call this EK. These are parts of the um, cover mono factorizations of the various iterated diagonals. That's, the, that's what we learn here. Let's make a definition. This definition is due to Lurie. Um, a topological localization of an infinity category is a left exact, I should have also said accessible here. Actually, no, I don't have to say accessible. It's part of the point. Every left exact localization of an, a left exact localization, sorry, a topological left exact localization start over. A topological localization of an infinity category is, is a left exact localization whose kernel 
is generated by some set of monomorphisms. That's a definition. And the theorem you can prove is that every left exact localization of, oops, um, I should say something's a little bit wrong here. This is of an of an n topos. Every left left exact localization of an n topos with n less than infinity is topological. That's a combination of the fact, the fact that I proved here that the class, uh, the kernel, the n truncated maps in the kernel are determined by the ones that are monomorphisms, and the fact that all maps in an n category, like an n topos, are truncated at some level. Uh, they are all, in fact, n truncated. Sorry, n minus one truncated. Doesn't matter. They're all finitely truncated for some given value. Okay. So. What we're actually interested in are the topological localization of the pre-sheaf category, meaning pre-sheaves with values in infinity groupoids. Um, so if I have a topological localization, by definition, that means that the kernel is generated, it's the strong saturation of a set of monomorphisms. Now monomorphisms form a local class in the pre-sheaf category, we have a collection of objects which are the representable pre-sheaves and they're generators for that category in sort of the usual sense, the infinity category. Everything's a co-limit of some small diagram of, rep of representables. So if I have a topological localization, I can argue so that I can replace my, my set S with a particular kind of set, a set of monomorphisms whose targets are the representables. I actually have to use the fact that it's a, the kernel is a local class in order to do this. So what I learn is that every topological localization of pre-sheaves determines a Grotendieck topology on the infinity category C. Um, so what's a Grotendieck topology on C? Well, you can define it as a collection of sieves that is to say, a collection of sub-objects of representable pre-sheaves, um, which satisfy a list of properties, which I won't give, but it's a standard list of properties that is familiar um, as one of the standard ways of describing a Grotendieck topology on a one category. Um, very often, people choose to describe the, the topology you know, using a different language, using covering families. But any, co any family of maps to an object in C determines a sieve. So you can reformulate it in terms of sieves. Um, I'll note here that this is this is an infinity analog of the notion of a Grotendieck topology, but it's not actually require it doesn't actually require uh, sort of any deep ideas. These are actually in bijective correspondence to Grotendieck topologies on H one of C. So remember, every infinity category has an associated sort of initial one category that it maps to. In this case, it's called the homotopy category, the infinity category. Um, and so in fact, Grotendieck topologies on C correspond to Grotendieck topologies on the homotopy category. So they actually correspond to conventional Grotendieck topologies there in the usual sense. That's because you can read off sub-objects of representables from the homotopy category, that's all. So the conclusion is that every topological localization of pre-sheaves is of the form sheaves CS for some infinity site. So associated to an infinity site, which is an infinity category with a Grotendieck topology, you can describe a full subcategory of sheaves. This will be exactly the collection of pre-sheaves 
such that this is an isomorphism for every morphism in the set S of things in the Grundig topology. So that characterizes the topological localizations of presheaves. Now I can do something similar when n is less than or equal to infinity, that as I look at localizations, left exact localizations of presheaves of n minus one groupoids, in this case, every left exact localization is topological. I think I said something like that here. So here, every left exact localization is a category of sheaves for some insight. So here C is an N category and S is a Grundig topology on the N category. If N is less than infinity, everything is, is a category of sheaves on a site. In the case of N equals one, this is the classical statement about Grundig, Grundig uh, topoi, which is usually actually taken as the definition. Okay. Now, of course, I've emphasized that in the infinity case, this is only the case for the topological localizations. There's also a notion of cotopological localization. What's a cotopological localization? A cotopological localization of a presentable infinity category, that's an accessible left exact localization with the property that its kernel is such that the only monomorphisms in the kernel are the isomorphisms. So it's sort of a, as far as you can be from being topological. And then you can show that an accessible left exact localization of an infinity topos is co-topological if and only if its kernel is contained in the class of infinity connected maps. The proof, I won't write it out, but it's by the same ideas that I've already shown that show that the topological localizations are determined by monomorphisms. Oh, actually there's a sketch of a proof here, but I'm not really gonna give the full details. Um, in one direction, it's obvious. Um, um, if you have a, a the, if the kernel is consists of uh, actually in one direction, it's obvious. Um, if the if it's co-topological, then well, you already know the infinity connected maps are, which are monomorphisms, are the isomorphisms. In the other direction, if you have a if, if the kernel containing infinity connected maps, you have to show it's containing the n connected maps for all n. What? I'm going the wrong way around. I think this page is again messed up somehow. Proving this direction. Here I proved this direction. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, so if you have a co topological localization, you first show that all elements of the kernel are, are covers. And to do that, you just use the epi monofactorization or the cover monofactorization of F. Um, if F is in the kernel, well, that means that I is a monomorphism. We've seen this before, but L of, L of I is a monomorphism, therefore, and L of F is an isomorphism. But you can use that, therefore, to show that L of all these things are isomorphisms because you have a monomorphism with a section. Um, so, or sorry, you can use that to show So oh, it's cotopological. This shows, therefore, that I is in T. But therefore, because it's cotopological, I is an isomorphism. Therefore, F is a cover. And then there's a similar argument that works inductively on N um, to show that T is contained in the N connected maps for all N. You have to use a fact I haven't proved, um, but it's the fact that if you have a cover, then F is N connective if and only if it's diagonal 
is n minus one commit. This is a sort of an inductive argument that sort of comes ultimately from the inductive definition of truncate, truncatedness, of n truncatedness. Okay. Let me give an example of such a co-topological localization. So if I have an infinity topos, we say that an object is hypercomplete if um, its projection is orthogonal to all the infinity connected maps. This determines a full subcategory of hypercomplete objects. And that full subcategory is an example of a co-topological localization. In fact, it's the kernel of this localization is exactly the collection of all infinity connected maps. So this is in some sense, the maximal co-topological localization, kill all the infinity connected maps. Um, so it's a formal consequence of these definitions that if you have an in truncated object, it's, uh, uh, which is, it's automatically hypercomplete. So the in truncated hypercomplete objects are all the hyper are all the intricated objects if n is finite. So this hypercompletion is is a phenomenon does it does not is not seen from finitely truncated objects. So for instance, if you had a if you looked at sort of less than or equal to zero, you, you know all the objects are hypercomplete hypercomplete. There, truncated objects are always hypercomplete. Um, so, for example, this, the, this example that I gave, not in the previous lecture, but earlier, uh, well, previous hour, I guess, uh, of a particular topological space with an object that's not infinity connect, that's infinity connected, but not trivial, that's an example of an infinity topos that is not hypercomplete. It has a non-trivial hypercompletion because it has non-trivial infinity connected maps. Now there's a theorem which does describe all the accessible left exact localizations of an infinity topos. They all factor essentially uniquely as a composite of two localizations. First, there's a topological localization and then there's a co-topological localization of that. Um, so as a consequence, every infinity topos is a co-topological localization of sheaves on some infinity site. So the idea is that E will be a co-topological localization. And so the, the way it works is that L inverts at least some infinity connected maps. So anyway, the consequence is that not every infinity topos is sheaves on a site, but there is this co-topological, um, everything is a co-topological localization. I should mention here, it's a, a historical thing. So there's actually a class of infinity topoi that were constructed um, before the infinity categorical language by Andre Jarrell and then by Rick Jardine. Um, these are, uh, model categories of simplicial tree sheaves on a one site, one site. Um, these model categories give you infinity categories and these actually give you hyper completions. They construct the hyper completion of what I'm calling sheaves on the, on the site sheaves on the one site viewed as an infinity site, of course. A one site is actually a kind of infinity site. So um, that's because if you look at their construction, they actually define their weak equivalences in terms of a notion of homotopy group. So their notion of homotopy group cannot see um, infinity connected objects sort of by the nature of homotopy groups. This ultimately leads to a question, is every infinity topos equivalent to some 
infinity category of sheaves on an infinity site? Um, it may seem like I've told you the answer is no, but what I told you um, is that there are examples of infinity topoi which I've constructed, you know, which admit non-trivial cotopological localizations. In some sense, the proofs I've given you tell you that the canonical site, can, the canonical site of an infinity topos um, might not um, give, a t give, give E, might not have E as a topological localization. The obvious thing, topological localization, the obvious thing to do is to take a large, you know, a small but a full subcategory of E that's closed under finite limits, show that it's a left exact localization of pre-sheaves on that, that's a canonical site. Those are often not topological localizations for a random infinity topos. So it's an open question, I believe, as to whether this is true. I thought for a long time this, of course, the answer is no, because look at these examples I have, but they weren't actually examples of this. It's very hard, seems very hard to address that question because I don't know anything that distinguishes the infinity topoi which come from infinity sites that are sheaves on infinity site. I don't know of any property those have that something else might not have. So I don't even know where to start to try to prove this. So it's in principle, it's possible that the answer is yes. I think the answer will likely be no, but who knows. Okay. I see here I'm going still going a little bit over on time. I do want to talk about geometric morphisms. And this is very straightforward because you just do the things that work for one topoi. So a geometric morphism is a between infinity topoi is a functor or sorry, F is an adjoint pair of functors, where the left adjoint is in fact left exact, because there's finite limits. This gives you an infinity category of geometric morphisms. The notations people use here are fun lower star from E to F, but you can also have fun upper star from F to E. And that depends whether you prefer to think about the left adjoint or the right adjoint. Um, this also gives you an infinity category of infinity topoi. So this has the property that the space of maps of infinity topoi from E to F is the maximal subgroupoid of this functor category. Of course, these are potentially large uh, infinity categories, and this is a large infinity groupoid in general, can be. Um, I actually showed you the recipe for computing geometric morphisms last time. To compute, for instance, a geometric morphism to pre-sheaves on something. So let's compute the fun upper star, so the left adjoints. So those are going to be the colon preserving functors, which are also left exact. So that's a full subcategory of the category of colon preserving functors. Um, Pre-sheaves are the uh, colonic completion of C. So colon preserving functors from pre-sheaves are the same as just functors from C. The inverse is the left con extension along the oneta. And you can describe what this full subcategory is. These are the functors, colon preserving functors, such that, well, they satisfy these conditions that I gave. It takes the terminal object to the terminal object, and F preserves the pullbacks of cospans of representables. Rho is the data. So this remarkably nice set of conditions. Um, consequences, well, an immediate consequence, there exists a unique geometric morphism to infinity groupoids. So that thing there is the terminal infinity topos, infinity groupoids. Uh, if you have an infinity topos, a point is just a geometric morphism from S. Um, as you can do in one topoi, you can say that infinity topos has enough points 
if the uh, left adjoints, the stalk functors, for all points are jointly conservative. But there's a war warning that comes in here, and it has to do with the fact that infinity groupoids are hypercomplete. So the infinity connected maps and infinity groupoids are just the isomorphisms. Um, so if I define having enough points in this sense, then E can have enough points um, only if it's hypercomplete. The stalks cannot see infinity connected objects just because the infinity group always doesn't have any. In fact, in practice, um, um, at least if you look at some of the things that Jake, has, Jake Leary has done, you, know, you take as a definition, it has enough points. If it's hypercompletion, has enough points in the sense I've described. So that's an additional um, issue that shows up um, in the setting. Of course, even for a one topos, you could just fail, straight up fail to have enough points. Um, oh, here's a, if you want to compute maps into a slice, there's a recipe. Uh, the uh, maps of an infinity topos f into the slice of e over x, which is also an infinity topos, well, that corresponds to geometric metric morphisms to E together with a section of the pullback of F in F. Um, as a consequence, this actually gives you a fully faithful embedding of your infinity topos into the slice in infinity category of infinity topoi over E. You just send um, an object to its slice together with its forgetful functor to E. Okay. Oh, here's one more example. Um, torsors, this is sort of the classic example of a geometric morphism. Let's take a small infinity group or it might be easier to think of a group. So it has one object. And let's compute the geometric morphisms from E to pre sheets So I'll actually compute the left adjoints. Okay, so these are gonna be the, 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 the functors from G op to E, which satisfy my conditions, takes the terminal object to the terminal object and preserves pullbacks of cospans of representables. The second condition is automatically satisfied because um, groupoids have pullbacks. They just do because everything's an isomorphism. So I only actually need the first condition. So this will correspond to the functors P sets so the co-limit as a functor on G, I guess on G op, is the terminal object. This is actually the correct definition of a G torsor in the context of infinity uh, topoi. This may not look like what you would call a G torsor, but here's why. Um, this condition is equivalent to the following. It, well, certainly implies the following. First of all, if I have such a functor and I have this property so that its co-limit is the terminal object, then I obtain a cover as a morphism of E. I take the co-product of all the values of my functor at all objects of G, and the map from the co-product is, a, is a, a cover by the general property I told you before. Second of all, I have another thing that comes from descent. So let's suppose I have one of these P, with this property. Let's consider for any pair of objects in my infinity group or a G, I, I can associate to that a map, which you can think of as the action. So I have PX, PY, and then I have the infinity group void of maps from Y to X in G, I guess in G, I guess that's in G. I can pull that back, pi here is the projection is the ge unique geometric morphism to infinity group words. So if you like, this is a map P times G to P, if G is a group, or really the pullback of G. So it's the action map. Now, this fits together if I let Y vary. So this actually is a functor, gives me a functor from G op to my infinity topos the value at y is what I've written above. 
um, the, the X is fixed. So this is for each X. P of X times P star, the pullback of the representable pre-sheaf on G to E maps to P. But now I can form the co-limit with respect to G op. By definition, because it's a G torsor, the co limit of P is the terminal object. Um, you can compute the co limit on the left hand side using university, uh, universality of co limits to get rid of this factor that's just constant. That's really P of X times the co limit of the representable. Co limits of representable functors are terminal, and pi star preserves co limits. So, in fact, this is just P of X. That's the co-limit of that transformation. Now, the thing about this transformation, it's actually a Cartesian natural transformation of functors from G op to E. For every morphism in G, you get a, the, you plug that into the transformation, you get a pullback square, and that should be just because it's an infinity, it's a groupoid. So in fact, you get a square where both arrows are isomorphisms. Well, now I have descent. Descent tells me if I form this co-limit and then I pull back again to each object, I get a pullback square. So I have a pullback square for every X and Y. If I write this out just for a group, then it's really saying this, P times the pullback of G to P to P to one is a pullback. In other words, this thing is equivalent to the product of P with P by sort of a tautological pair of maps, which are projection and if you like the action map. That recovers the classical definition of uh, uh, a torsor in the one category case, but it's, a, it's in some sense a different definition in the infinity category case. Oh. So torsors are, oddly have a much easier, def, cleaner definition in infinity to avoid. All right, I'm very low on time. Let me run through a couple, of, one remaining uh, uh, topic. There's something called n localic reflection. So I have an infinity category of infinity topoi or of n topoi. And there's a functor which is given by take your infinity topos and restrict to the full subcategory of n minus one truncated objects. That admits an adjoint, which hopefully this is correct, is a right adjoint. I'll call this RNF, it's called the N localic reflection. You can always promote for any N, an N topos to an infinity topos in a canonical way. And here's the formula. If I start with an N topos, we said that those were always categories of sheaves of n minus one groupoids on an n minus one site. I can actually pick this so that the underlying category C has finite limits. So the recipe to compute the n locale reflection is you pick such a site with finite limits that presents your n topos, and then the n locale reflection is sheaves of infinity groupoids on the same site which is also an infinity site. I guess I'm supposed to call this an N site. I'm consistent. Um, so that's the formula for N localic reflection. Everybody forgets the fact, well, I always forget the fact that it has to be, you have to use a category of finite limits, otherwise you get the wrong answer. Okay. Um, so I'm at the end of my time, I'll notice one more uh, property here um, you can define cohomology of an infinity topos. So I have this uh, unique morphism, geometric morphism to infinity groupoids. So I have a pair of adjoint functors, constant and the constant pre sheaf and the global sections. So if I take an Eilenberg McLean space in spaces, I can pull that back to E and then push it forward again, taking global sections. And then that defines the cohomology of my infinity topos with constant coefficients, which are an abelian group. I'll take the appropriate homotopy group of this thing. I can use various n here, which are bigger than j. 
Um, so of course, um, notice I only remember McLean spaces are in truncated. So this invariant, it's certainly not a complete invariant, but it certainly does not distinguish. Um, say E from its own hypercompletion, because the pullback of the Elmer plane object is already going to be in truncated. This gives you the same answer for both E and its hypercompletion. However, this idea does lead to a very nice formulation of the uh, idea of the shape of an infinity topos. Using this projection, Q, you get this composite functor. Um, Q upper star following Q lower star. And this is an, uh, uh, an example of a, of a functor from S to S. And it's in a full subcategory, which is called pro S, um, which we can define to be the collection of functors from S to itself, which are left exact. Or more precisely, we define it to be the opposite category. It's also, it turns out, a category of inverse limits of representables, um, of filtered inverse limits. So it's reasonable to call it pro S. It has a, a tautological uh, embedding uh, by S itself, by the UNATA functor. And so every infinity topos has a shape, which is a pro space in the sense. And you can prove, for instance, that if X is a nice enough space, if it's paracompact, then shape of sheaves on X Notice here, I'm using space in the sense of actual topological space. If it's paracompact, then its shape is in fact determined by its underlying homotopy type. Um, bar X here is the infinity groupoid, which is the, homoto the, the usual homotopy type of the topological space X. Every topological space has a homotopy type, which you think of as an infinity groupoid. So paracompact topological spaces have sort of classical shapes, but there's a general theory of shapes. All right, since I'm out of time, I'll have to stop. I wrote down some pages that talked about applications. Um, an important one is you can talk about sheaves of infinity categories on an infinity topos. By the way, do you want me to go on or do you want me to wrap things up? I can take five minutes and just fill in these pages. Uh, yes, maybe just five minutes, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, you I mean, it's quick. I can just yeah. fill in the definitions. Uh -huh. If I have an infinity topos and I have an infinity category that's complete, we can just define a sheaf on E with values in A to be a functor from E op to A, which preserves all limits, all small limits. Um, if, if E is sheaves on a site, you can reinterpret this as in sort of a more conventional way as sheaves on a site. Um, so for instance, I can define things like sheaves of infinity categories, maybe large ones, even on E. So the example I wanted to mention is like the type of example that I mentioned in the very beginning, just to be specific, if I have a scheme, I have for every open set, some derived category of quasi-coherent sheaves. That's the one category. This doesn't form a sheaf, but derived categories come from infinity categories. A derived category is the homotopy category of an infinity category. And the relation that sends U to its derived infinity category is in fact a sheaf in this sense. This provides a language for talking about Cheese and infinity categories. Um, in some sense, this is interesting, even if E is just a one topos. Of course, if you have a one topos, you can promote it to an infinity topos and then talk about sheaves of infinity categories and infinity topos. And this is already useful in classical settings. And, you know, when I talk about these kinds of derived categories, and people are doing that. Um, Infinity topoi were really introduced by these authors for talking about derived geometry. So if you have A as some category of ring-like objects, which could be commutative DGAs or E infinity ring spectra, if you like homotopy theory, then you obtain the notion of a ringed infinity topos, an infinity topos together with a sheaf with values in A 
one of these generalized categories of rings. And this leads to a notion of derived geometry. And to be honest, most of the interest is in this, ca this category of generalized rings. But it's, in some sense, you need this notion of infinity topos in order to make sort of decent definitions. Um, differential cohomology. This turns out to be a sort of an area where these have turned out to be useful. So differential cohomology, they, these are invariants of smooth manifolds that combine things like singular cohomology, say with integer coefficients, with Durham cohomology, with the cohomology represented by differential forms. So what you can do is you can form an infinity topos. This is a gross infinity topos, a gross infinity topos of sheaves of infinity groupoids on the large site of C infinity manifolds, which is actually essentially small, so it's fine. Um, this contains objects like Eilenberg of Klein objects, which represents actually the singular cohomology of manifolds, but it also represents and contains objects like omega n, which represents things like differential forms. And you can combine these to give things that represent differential cohomology. So this is a nice context where they're useful. Here's a page where I couldn't think of anything useful to say on one page, so I won't. Um, there's some interesting recent work by Barwick, Glassman, and Hain on a paper called ex exodromy. I don't know how to pronounce that word, exodromy, um, which uses stratified infinity topoi and theories of constructible sheaves on infinity topoi to do some kind of generalizations of a sort of classical Galois theory. In the, in the context of uh, algebraic geometry. Finally, I should mention the logical aspects of infinity topo, and I didn't want to take much time on this because I don't understand this very much. So in one topo, one topo I have an internal language. Um, there's something, for instance, called the mitchell benabu language, and that has an interpretation in a one topos. Um, so there's a, a notion of type theory due to Martin Luff called dependent type theory, which has an interesting aspect. It introduces types for identity. Instead of just having a, a sort of a, 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 a relation, we have an identity type between uh, any two terms of some other type. It also, in many formulations, introduces type families. So there's some sort of universal type. And it was noticed that these identity types behave like spaces of paths in a space, which suggests a homotopy theoretic interpretation, which was developed by Erwody and Warren and by Vladimir Vavatsky, and which led to the notion of univalent type theory. Um, let me not try to des describe what univalent type theory is, because honestly, that's a whole lecture in itself and one I'm not competent to give. But Wojewski showed that infinity groupoids, that is simplicial sets, form a model for his univalent type theory. Um, in particular, univalent type theory has this universal type, and that cor corresponds to what I called the object classifier, the, the base of the universal morphism classifier. Um, more generally, in fact, it was early recognized that this was true, and it's been proved by Shulman, that in some sense, every infinity topos is a model for univalent type theory. So you can say that univalent type theory is the internal language of an infinity topos in some sense. Um, but you do have to be careful with that statement. There is an issue here. It's not really an inter internal language in the way that I've been talking about infinity topoi. Um, type theory, including this uh, univalent type theory, it has functions which can be composed and that composition is actually associative on the nose. It's just built into the way functions are described because they look like, kind of look vaguely like functions of sets. Um, so any model of such a type theory must be a one category, must be a one category. Um, 
And that's the sort of model that these people have constructed. They've constructed models that are, for instance, a Quillen model category, who's, um, which is only a one category, but the Quillen model category structure is used in describing how the model works. Vibrations play an important role. Um, and so this theorem really says that it's a Quillen model category. They can be chosen to be Quillen model categories whose corresponding infinity category, the infinity category you can extract from that one category is an infinity topos. So that's the sense in which every infinity topos is a model for a univalent type for univalent type theory. It's via one of these Quillen model categories. And the interpretation is actually in the one category. Um, I don't think anybody knows how to make uh, this kind of linguistic or language or internal language that describes doing infinity category theory. This, isn't really something I think anybody's really figured out to do in sort of a way that seems practical to me. So I think that's something that's an interesting subject if you like those things. All right, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very nice and very rich course.